I titled the talk appropriately with BPF, LSM, and etc. because it's got a bunch of other random stuff. Thank you, Alexei, for uh, saving me because I was making the slides as I was sitting there. Uh, and your extra half an hour helped me uh, polish my slides a little bit, although they're not as polished. Uh, the intent behind the talk is that your folks ask me questions as well. Uh, I, I know that there are some use cases here for signed BPF that we've talked about. And we've been talking about it for the last three years, so I need to put that put some clarity on the topic, find a framework that we can understand this and move forward. Uh, uh, I, I'll start with some updates on BPF LSM in the industry and in the maintainership. So we do have a new maintainer for the BPF LSM who works at Google. It's a real person, so that's a big plus these days. Uh, I do see a lot of security use cases, projects using BPF. BPF for security is the right way to put it. Uh, Tetragon, right? Like this is this is policy enforcement and monitoring. I saw Cube Armor, not Cub Armor. Uh, the there is a system D file system ac access restriction. I also noticed a pattern that these projects, even though there is a lot more flexibility in the LSM programs, you have much more helper access. They tend to use tracing hooks and modify return programs. Modify return programs is the way we got LSMs in the kernel. Like it was a Trojan horse for security work. Uh, uh, and the reason for that is BPF LSM has overhead. It's not enabled in distros by default. Uh, you'll see my three year long effort to fix this later on. And also backward compatibility. For, for distros and older kernels and LTS kernels that don't have the LSM support, what do we do, right? Do we have our product not work there? And what's the real win uh, when we use LSM? I followed the BPF token work uh, and re got it merged. That's pretty good for security from a security perspective. Not just for containers, but for an application that is running as root. If you can create a token and pass on the token around in the life cycle of the application after dropping privileges, it's a win for security, right? Then you have then you're basically adhering to principle of least privilege. Uh, I sh I'm sharing an update from uh, Matt here that uh, uh, who I would have really liked to be at this conference, so maybe we can have Matt do the updates next year. Uh, he's working on uh, uh, non-zero offset pointers to trusted args. Some of the things we notice in LSM programs is LSM programs, some helpers need trusted args, and sometimes the arg that you want to be trusted is nested in a struct, and thus loses the struct, uh, the trust of the verifier. So he's, Matt has been working on that, and he's, he's finally got some time to uh, respin that. Uh, so yeah, so I, I'm, I'm going to discuss three topics here. The signed, or as I want to call it, trusted BPF. Static calls, what's going on? Will it get merged before I before the next two generations of my family work in BPF by 3025? And what do we do about kernel functions, right? How do we get kernel functions available uh, from other, other subsystems so that we can make more powerful LSMs? So have you got a handle of signed BPF? We've had a lot of We've had a lot of talks on the list on in LSFMM BPF, and I think I've finally grappled with the, the the concept. And I think it's better to call this trusted BPF because that's what the signature actually represents, right? Signature is one way of attaining trust in the whole BPF uh, execution chain, the loader, the program, right? So we can we can delineate between trusted BPF loaders. And when you sign a BPF loader with a private key that you have in your locker somewhere, you say that that signature represents the trust that this loader is not going to load malicious programs. Right? Trusted BPF programs are a little bit deeper. They, they go, and this is typically what we, we've been calling signed BPF. Right? I trust that this program is not malicious and potentially towards build time security of the program. This program was built in a build server that has a private key and, and the compiler has not done something funky with this. And, and we can sort of make a hypothesis that trusted loaders load trusted programs. That's why you're trusting them. Otherwise, there's no point trusting them. So how can we represent the trust? Right? You take a private key, you sign the loader program, when the program executes, the kernel verifies the signature of the program and then allows BPF operations. For the Cilium use case, right, somebody, so a distro that is enabling Cilium in, the, uh, in, the con in, in their, like, in the container or distro, 
they can sign the program and this represents that the whole life cycle like Cilium will not generate malicious programs. You can't feed Cilium arbitrary programs to load. I hope not, right? And and that signature represents that whatever the generation code is there in Cilium is something I trust and something that cannot be attacked. You combine with this this with the token BPF token stuff and it becomes even more secure because you don't have elevated privileges throughout the life cycle. The BPF trace case is also interesting, right? Uh, you you want a version of BPF trace that can only load signed scripts. So you trust a you trust a BPF trace. You, you can't really trust a random BPF trace binary that has no signed script loading support because it can load any BPF program, right? But what you can do is you can say that this BPF uh, trace ships with a verification key, and that verification key will verify the a signature of the script when it is being loaded, right? So the, the, the root of trust then goes to your kernel being trusted because you're running the OS. You, the verifier and everything is trusted because you trust the OS and it's in a, a part of your boot time security. And in this case, you trust long-term loaders or short-term loaders or, uh, or, or like pretty dynamic loaders if you can attest to the programs they load. But that is not a kernel problem. The fact that the signature of these dynamically generated programs needs to be verified can be delegated to the trusted loader itself. So BPF trace can figure out its own trusting mechanism. It can say, I trust BPF trace scripts that are less than 10 strings long, right? It's something like that. If you trust that thing, you're fine. So I did a little prototype, and I'll do a demo of how this works. Uh, I want to thank Song uh, for this. Uh, Song's uh, dem uh, 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 I initially started with the BPF file get exactor uh, helper. It got stuck. I got tired of the debate, and I, I backed off. Uh, Song pulled it off and got it merged in the kernel. This was very helpful implementing this. Uh, there's a uh, self-test in the kernel that tries to you do so, like use the helper, but I've refined this self-test into something of a more concrete example. Uh, BPF verify uh, signature. Uh, yeah, you 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 call this helper to verify the signature generated by FS Verity, and you can then verify the signature. Uh, you 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 do this at the load time of the program, uh, the execution time of the, your trusted program, and then you set a blob on the on on the task struct. That blob is then retrieved at various BPF operation times. You can then say that unless this, ex uh, the, this task struct has uh, this blob on it, no BPF operations are allowed, right? And that's the first gatekeeper uh, to, uh, to access BPF. The next gatekeepers, if you want to run with principle of least privilege, you can use the BPF, BPF token. What you also do, you also do, this is a common pattern I see in LSM programs anyways, is you, you pass these blobs around when the task forks in the life cycle of the, the, or the whole process tree. So, yeah. You need to do some uh, FS Verity stuff, like you need to have the FS Verity enabled on the partition. Uh, so there's a, there's a little command that you have to run. It was failing for me for random reasons, and I realized that FS Verity needs to be first enabled on the partition so that it has support to calculate all the Merkle trees. Then you sign this with your private key. The signature can be done at like a phase when the machine or your distro is in an install phase and the key being removed from, from, that, from that machine. You can have it done uh, at package time and the signature ships with the package on an FS Verity lock partition. This is not my area of speciality, but there are existing paradigms that do this pretty well. Uh, and on the machine, you just have the verification key. Uh, and that's the key you load in the kernel keychain. And that is how you verify the signature. Uh, the, the FS Verity signature is not loaded in the extended attributes by default. Maybe this is some support we can add on the FS Verity command that we can load the signature as an extended attribute. Otherwise, this is like a two-phased step to load the signature as the uh, extended attribute in uh, FS Verity. Also, the uh, signature is a binary blob. So if you l try to do it over command line with get F at her, it just is painful and doesn't work. So you have to write your own C code. Luckily, we can generate, write the simple C code with uh, uh, generative AI these days. Uh, on this, uh, yeah, and on the machine, once you're done, you enable FS Verity on the file, and it works. So I don't have a demo for the tokens for trusted load, but uh, as I said, you only allow the BPF token to be created for trusted programs. So that's where you put your signature verification in the LSM hook BPF token create, security BPF token create. Uh, and then the loader, once it creates the token, it can drop cap 
whatever like it can run unprivileged and and this is this reduces your attack surface at runtime if you find an rce on a, on this like you are running with effectively low privileges at this point uh, for the loader uh, and and you can yeah you you can also ensure that all operations, and I don't know whether this is possible, maybe Andre can tell me, but can I say that all normal BPF operations are blocked, And but it would be blocked if I drop privileges, right? Uh, that's that's okay, yeah, that's the answer to this. So I'm gonna show a demo and then I go to the static call stuff before, but do you have any questions around trusted loaders and signed BPF? Are we clear on 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 this on the delineation between signed BPF programs and signed signed loaders because we've historically conflated this. Um, so I think we have use case. We want to sign the shared library, and so have you get like ideas or like uh, experience doing that, or we have to get the shared the trusted loader to be static linked to avoid the, the shared library thing. I think it's best to get the trusted loader to be statically linked. Unless you trust your your uh, your shared library is in your root of trust installed at boot time, and you trust that all libraries installed on this partition are something that I trust, right? So you don't need to sign the shared code, but yeah, then you have attacks like uh, preload attacks and all that. So I would say we, off the top of my head, I would say we need to uh, use like. Uh, Statically, in Google, everything is statically linked, so I didn't bother about it. <laughs> so uh, I was thinking, like, we probably should do. It's probably possible to do the same thing, as we have the the LSM hooks to to check the like uh, when we load the library. But that seems trickier than when we load the binary because there's multiple steps. There's things could get messy. This doesn't happen in kernel, right? So you need to have something in something in a trusted user space uh, that does this. So you will you will need some sort of signed binary loading hooks on something that is already. I don't know how this happens. This is probably an IMA territory question. In this case, I would just like statically link the loader and and be done with that. Right? Got it. Thanks. Just one technicality about the token stuff. I think right now we don't allow uh, to create BPF token in the init user NS. So you need to have a child user namespace to be able to create token. We can probably lift that, but that was Any the outcome reason? of the upstream discussions. We, we disabled that for for like root user namespace. Is there any reason why we implemented it? Uh, we had a long discussion about like not regressing all the capability checks if there is token FD. Uh, it's okay, so you created in a child user namespace. The child user namespace has all the capabilities, so then you don't regress the capability checks. Then you had an additional token check. Yeah, we, we, I mean we can chat offline. I don't remember all the details, but right now, like if you mount BPFFS with token enabled in the init user NS, you won't be able to create BPF token. It will be rejected with EOP e not supported. Okay, that's good. I didn't spend time prototyping this. But but I, I think like what you're proposing, right? To use token as a as a thing to restrict yourself through LSM, right? Like saying just just reject if there is no token Correct. is a good idea. So maybe we should lift that. Okay. I'd like to open up the conversation we briefly had last night with regards to signing the library versus uh, or a, a sh signed shared library versus statically linked. And that is looking at basically the compatibility story of BPF programs that were built for a, a potentially older version of a library. And so if your loader has that, a newer version statically linked in or you're looking to update that version and you break that compatibility, the, the idea that was brought up last night was basically, okay, so you need to create a compatibility layer for your, for your lo trusted loader. Aren't we just fragmenting the ecosystem further by essentially making another language or another scripting API at that point? It's it's not a it's not a uh, I mean Cilium loads its own uh, BPF programs right, and it, it it depends on what it depends on uh, whether you so if you have the use case of restricting BPF program loading right to to something, then this is the way to do it. Does it come? Will there be compatibility challenges without this? Yes. Will there be compatibility challenges with this? Yes. So the invariant still holds. 
uh, where how, as to how this is my trusted loader is implemented this could be like a direct proxy to libbpf and signed right that's one to one so your compatibility story there is just the same as you would have with libbpf your com you, if you if you want to protect your users because you think libbpf doesn't really do, do that properly then you can add your own compatibility checks on top of libbpf right i have personally have not had issues with libbpf so for me if this was just a one to one proxy and you really want to allow libbpf plus some policy and sign that combination together that works as well right so yes it, there are multiple different approaches here my concern is that just that if you add that compatibility layer in there we're just fragmenting further we have Cilium, we have bpf trace and we'd be adding another another thing there i think the the fragmenting already exists there are loaders that are trying to come into this place providing a safe way to load bpf programs we we see this we saw this in the bsc as well where there are a few project proposals in this area so I, I, I'm just giving a way for them to be trusted, right? I'm not solving the fragmentation. The fragmentation can be solved by people who can who can have a, a way to make it trusted. Thanks. Um, I just want to say, like, um, from my perspective as a system the user guy, a user space guy. Um, it leaves me a little bit head scratching. Like you know, we started to make use of BPF LSM and and in Systemd recently, and the the one major criticism that I always get for that is that uh, as long as I've signed um, BPF, um, it's problematic for many people to enable this and use it. Like actually, my employer that's the Microsoft position on BPF right, right now as well, but. Um, <clears throat> As I understand this, right now you expect that the loaders are static compiled binaries. Well, I'm sure that's great in the Google world. Um, the rest of the world doesn't work like that, right? Like we have dynamic um, uh, uh, binaries and the generic distributions getting that stuff. I mean, uh, to, let be, me, to be explicit, this is never going to fly in system D, right? L let me correct my stance here. I don't expect this to be true. I just haven't thought about it, right? So I think I think in in a, in a world where trusted you can you can split this into two two problems, right? Trusted library load, right? That's not a problem I'm trying to solve here. Uh, trusted execution in general is is a is a is a solved problem out there in industry in the in in the industry. So I am building on that with FS Verity and DM Verity and stuff, right? So if you say that my and Again, I have not looked into that because it, that was not my use case. But I do think it is out there for us to have trusted library load, have shared libraries, and still come up with a trusted loader with a chain of trust. Yeah, but I mean, I can tell you if, like, um, if, if we make systemd rely on a statically compiled signed binary or something like this, it's not gonna fly. We 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 can we can have trusted libraries as well. I can. I mean, I, now I'll be thinking on the stage live, but you can have a. Uh, before you load a library, you can verify the signature of the library itself. And if your loader ensures that you do that, then like I don't, I don't even understand what that means, right? Like I mean, a, a, a trusted C library. Yeah. What is that supposed to be? I mean, is the C library is loaded into other code, and then that other code is but that code the same is memory. that code is living on a partition you willingly installed on your system, right? Yeah, but I mean, let's say systemd is not trusted, and then you link it against the trusted library. But what does it mean? It's in the same shared memory area. It can do whatever it wants. Well, it's not a can, security model. Can you sign shared library as well? So like a first yeah. value, right? Like yeah. you just sign the file. So yeah. if your systemd like main binary is signed and trusted, yeah. and it dynamically loads. La, libbpf for example which is also fs variety signed right like isn't that like transitively trusted or at least can be assumed to how, how well, did you system d load so many other things it's 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 just it's like i mean you, you saw the jia tan thing right like there, there, there are shit loads of libraries dynamically that we cannot even predict um because there's nss pluggable modules like everything right so the 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 process that system d ultimately is is a combination of many many uh, things and they all run with the same privileges so a a combination of a signed shared library and something that is not signed doesn't work also i mean right as Verity, I mean, great as it is, that does not exist in generic distributions, right? So this is this is not going to solve the problem for anybody, but who subscribe to FS Verity, who subscribe to that static linking is okay. No, I, um, I have I have a point before we go into this, right? It's not going to solve a problem if you can't attest, if you don't have a trusted boot, if you don't have a trusted like the system D or your daemon forking story, you might as well not have a trusted PPF story either, right? You need you need to have the root of trust start from your boot 
to, to, to go on from there. You can't just say that like, oh yeah, I don't care about the kernel and the TPMs and all that, and I don't care about measured boot, but at some point in the life cycle of my machine, I'm going to start trusting, I want a trusted BPF story. So it is contingent on having a same, like, uh, uh, like sanitized boot, with, which you can trust. Sure, that's true, but I mean, um, there, there was this other patch, like Sendic, like two years ago, something which just added um, PKCS7 um, signature checking to kernel site uh, in BPF, so that user space doesn't have to have the same trust over there. Is, what happened to that? That's right? exactly what I'm using. I'll show you the demo. Uh, that's exactly but what I'm I mean. But I mean, but why do you need Verity then? I don't understand this, right? Why do you need. You use something else. That's the whole point of VPF, right? The but Verity is used to generate the digest easily that you can sign. If you want to generate the digest your own way, sure, like use your own digestion well, enzyme. Let's just say, okay, kernel module lo loading. Very similar problem, right? You have sure. some code that you load in the kernel. The entire verification of everything happens in the, on the kernel side, right? Like, and it's very easy. This happens on the kernel use. side as well. So. But why do you, uh, then I don't I think get the it fundamental the, difference. What's the trusted user space loading then? Because I, we do not have a trusted I, user space kernel module loader, right? Like, because we don't need to. Because if, if, you, if you don't have that. So what I'm saying is there are two, there are two ways to solve this. You can have trusted loaders, right? If you don't want to have trusted loaders and you want to just verify the signature of the BPF programs in the BPF program object blob in the kernel, that's also doable, right? I, I, you, I, let me show you the code. So KB, I think you should make it more explicit that it's really hard to have a practical signed BPF program as a standalone thing. I yeah. think that's the fundamental difference between the kernel modules and BPF program because the bytes that you have in L file compiled, right, like the BPF program, are very different from what kernel sees, right? So whatever you sign in L, like on disk, is absolutely different from what kernel sees. So like, what are you checking? Like you, the, the BPF object file goes through a lot of transformation, yeah. right? Like for relocations. And these transformations are all done in, in user space, you say? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And and sorry, like back to the, to the shared versus static. I don't think it matters. It's just that the, like if you want to have a trusted process, right? Like all the constituents should be trusted, right? So like all of your shared lives. I understand it might not be practical for you, right? But that that that's how it. It has to be, otherwise it's just like partially otherwise, otherwise, trusted or something. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Otherwise you have a you have a malicious system D that is doing some other stuff and you just tr trust that you want to trust the BPF programs that are loaded, but then it's all running as root at that time, right? Like why, if you can't trust that whole process tree, then it's game over. <laughs> I mean, uh, personally for me, it would be like a much simpler approach would be if there was a fuse we can blow, right? Like that we simply allow um, stuff to be loaded and then we blow the fuse and then it's not anymore. Like for my specific use cases, it probably would already be enough actually. So that fuse is basically the current approach for Android is we only allow BPF programs to be loaded by a single loader right now. And it's a one-time shot uh, application that runs early boot. And then after that, we don't allocate any other uh, of the BPF uh, permissions uh, to other programs. So we're trying to change that and open it up further. And I have a talk here in a little bit about potentially moving the loader into the kernel so that we solve the bytecode relocation um, look at, at that. So I'd like to carry the conversation forward there um, and hand the, hand the discussion back to KP um, so you can, you can move on. So I, I think the, the thing is you the, the loader in the kernel is good, but it's not going to be ever fully spec'd, right? So you're going to, if, if you're going to load, B, if you're going to allow BPF programs to be loaded, especially for the BPF trace use case or Selenium use case, there's no chance we're going to put all of that loader logic all in the kernel. This is not, like, this is not, on, not? on the table. It's, we'll be maintaining two different things in two different places. Like, and that's what, if, what if we move towards a single loader solution? So we're not, obviously, right off the bat, we're not going to be at feature parity. But down the road, what if we move? No, no, no it's not happening. Like, I, yeah. OK. Uh, okay, let me show you the code, and then this is a reference implementation, right? You have all these hooks, you have all the private keys, you have FS Verity, you have IMA, right? IMA pr provides your trusted measured boot story as well. So uh, if you can see this, uh, that is the policy. That is the policy program, right? This is where I. Uh, that's ba that's basically where I load the FS Verity digest from the file, and. This digest is something that is assigned digest stored in an extended attribute. 
I use FS Verity because it is easy. Right? You can use your own thing. Uh, and then uh, you have BPF get file exciter, which is what Song implemented to retrieve that extender attribute. Again, you could put this in a map in your, in your one-shot program that lays out the policy for you. That one-shot program is something you can load from the kernel that installs the overall policy for this. It, the fact that this is implemented in BPF is you have full control. But if you expect the loader to be in the kernel, that's going to be problematic. Uh, so a limited loader in the kernel makes sense to, for you to set up this policy, right? But for getting everything done and opening it up to all programs is going to be hard. Uh, that's the API for the signature checks uh, that uh, the gentleman there was talking about, right? It was the task storage get uh, and like BPF verify signature. So this is where we verify the signature. I'm going to go to the demo there right away. Uh, oops. Uh, quick, quick question. Yeah. So, was this uh, whatever like map colon task colon? It's the first time I see this kind of C. I guess I've been in the cave forever. Huh? Yeah, it's just that's UI. It is telling me what is the variable name. It's a modern editor, Alexei. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I, I have a, there's a talk by one of my teammates and Linux plumbers on how this whole VS Code Linux setup works. It allows you to run the kernel by pressing like F5 and builds the kernel, runs it, runs a VM in the VS Code itself, and you have full these sort of highlighting there as well. It also runs check patch in line for you. Uh, cool. So let me go to my terminal here. Uh, and I sourced a bunch of signing functions. And then if you have, uh, I have a BPF trace that I have uh, not, like I have signed. So this is where I'm loading the BPF program. Now it is pinned. It installs the policy. The policy says that all loaders must be signed with the private key, otherwise I'm going to reject everything, right? And if you look for BPF trace, I am doing like a BPF trace execution here where uh, uh, it works because this BPF trace bind reinstalled in slash user local pin is trusted. I've signed it with FS Verity. Uh, but you are running it under root. Can you run it not under root? Sorry? You are running BPF trace under root. How do I know that you're not lying? Like, see, right? Like you have hash. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's yeah. root. Like, can you run it from normal user? So, no, so this is, I've not implemented the token stuff yet here. Ah, okay. So, well, you don't need token to run. Uh, so now oh, you do. Okay. Now if I, right. if I run the All normal right. BPF trace here, okay. it rejects it, right? Like it's I not see. a trusted loader. And okay. if I look at uh, get f adder minus uh, n user dot sig uh, in So it is a sign, that's the signed digest that is being read by the kernel, and the kernel verifies this. All right. I and believe you. OK. <laughs> There's a bunch of trace print case there, too, uh, for the verity here. Uh, OK. Uh, the, the, we can have the, the, the follow-up of this conversation when, in your talk, right? Uh, so static calls in LSMs, this is, I think, what will allow us to enable LSMs by default on the fleet. Like, you, you have access to more helpers and fair interplay with other LSMs, the kind of stuff we talked about when we uh, introduced the LSM. Uh, a quick recap, I've made so many slides on this for the last three years, right, that uh, I, I don't want to do this again. If you want to talk more about why do we need static calls and how is this implemented, uh, you can come and talk to me. My personal experience is that it's been very painful to get this upstream. The, there has been a communication breakdown. But there were some lucky breaks this year, and I'll talk more about it. Uh, uh, my, it it's been a learning experience for me. Uh, the, the main thing I learned is I learned a lot of macro magic out of all of this. So that's I come out as a better engineer, maybe. Uh, <laughs> uh, so the reason why we want static calls in the LSM is the LSM hooks are implemented as indirect calls. As Alexei was talking about, that something we need in BPF is the indirect call, the address of the, inst the, the call instruction is loaded from memory. That load is something that the 
branch predictor in the CPU tries to predict. Uh, memory loads are slow, so the CPU just goes ahead with whatever information it has. That is, can be attacked with uh, an attack called branch target injection. You trick the CPU into executing code that it should not. It leaves some artifact in the cache. You time the cache, and you read the secret. Right. So there are a bunch of mitigations in the kernel that prevent it from happening. The first impact they have is mispredict that branch. Right. The CPU doesn't know where to go, so it becomes slow. The other impact is that these have there are things called uh, these crazy gadgets in the kernel code, which take extra instructions, are located at one point in the text section. Uh, tr make it generally slow. And the, there are these, uh, if you talk about the red pulling performance, there are a few instructions that deliberately slow the CPU down uh, uh, with, the po with the pause and elephants. So this trashes performance. It tra if you go to like my uh, the path, path series, it's about, some, in some sense calls, it's about 10% of performance. Uh, this year, what happened was there was another bug called branch history injection, right, which is something that kernel had historically not mitigated. And we were benchmarking the mitigation for this bug, and I noticed that the numbers that were coming up with, the upstream people were coming up, were different from the numbers I was coming up with. So I was actually running with my static call patches enabled, and this was making it faster with red pullings enabled. So I sort of hint, hint, like if you had this, it would have been faster. And turns out the gadget that was used potentially was also uh, an indirect call that it was that was in the LSM framework. So because you have these calls in virtually all sys calls, there for you to exploit, right? Uh, it creates sort of an additional attack surface for all these CPU bugs, and and we have more uh, we have more uh, momentum behind this. Well, Lena said that on the, he sent a reply to for the series. He said that this series needs to be turned to eleven. Uh, I lacked cultural context to understand that. I was at the V9 of my path series, and I didn't know that why is Linus asking me to spin it directly to 11. <laughs> but then I, I Google searched it, and I realized, and thanks, Daniel, for also giving me the uh, cultural references here. Uh, the other reason why we want to implement this is correctness. Right? We, the BPF LSM hooks installs an empty callback uh, in the LSM framework. No matter how hard you try to return a default value, you're executing code and returning a, making a decision, an implicit decision where you should not have made a decision. And that has led to side effects that are out there for people to uh, cause issues in the, in, the, in, in the distributions. We'll fix them with this patch series. The LSM call is guarded with a static key or a static branch. So static branch turns a call into a NOP if the call is inactive, right? And the call to the BPF LSM is by default a NOP. So it really results in truly zero overhead for BPF LSM, and it makes other LSMs faster as well. There's no reason to not do this. Uh, this is a discussion I, again, would like to open up to the floor here, right? We've, we, we need KFUNCs for the LSM framework to be more powerful. Right. Uh, there has been recent friction on additional uh, addition of KFUNCs that are from the like get MMEXE file, right? And and the uh, the arguments there are well, you added KFUNCs before, and you your KFUNCs are broken, right? And we shouldn't add them anymore. And that to me is a really uh, weak argument because have we not had kernel bugs before on other parts of the code base? And if not, then why have we not had kernel bugs that were created by kernel modules uh, for exported symbols? No. So I, I don't see that as an argument for resistance. But I do want us to, at LSFMMBPF to agree on a way where we can collaborate with other file system, uh, other maintainers, especially the VFS folks, right, to make these helpers available. File system operations are, uh, are key for detecting malicious activity key for detecting, like, preventing malicious activity as well. And not having these helpers limits uh, what Google is trying to do with this. So we need a framework of some sort, a treaty, right? Like a treaty for kernel function addition. And I don't have the details yet, but we have the people in the same location. Not in this room, unfortunately, I guess. But uh, maybe we can give you an update on when this discussion happens with the other folks uh, in the VFS land at the end of the conference. Does anyone have any other uh, uh, K funks they need added and were not added so that we can chase those maintainers as well? Or is it just the VFX fo VFS folks? OK. Cool. 
That's all from my talk, and we'll continue the signing discussion in your talk. Thank you so much.